Good evening and welcome. We're going to call the meeting, uh, the, this regular board meeting of the Akron Public Schools Board of Education for February 26, 2018 to order. Roll call, please. Mr. Alexander? Present. Mrs. Baylor? Here. Mr. Bravo? Yes. Here. Mrs. Lasher? Here. Mrs. Mansfield? Here. Mr. Miller? Here. Reverend Walker? Present. Voting. Thank you. Joining us in the Pledge of Allegiance tonight is, and I was late so I didn't get to say hi to you first, so, uh, but welcome, is Justin Walker. Justin Walker is a third grade student at Portage Path CLC. Justin enjoys playing baseball and recently signed up for the chess club at Portage Path CLC. His teacher, Miss Lockhart, describes Justin as an honor roll student who is polite, well-mannered, helpful, and very eager to learn. Justin, will you come up and join me and lead us in the pledge? So as we get started uh, this evening, I do want to take a, take a moment um, to recognize not only the, the tragedy in Parkland, Florida, but also uh, those here locally recently, uh, Northwest and down in Jackson, and take a moment to recognize um, the seriousness and, and and the sadness that everyone's feeling around the issue of uh, student uh, or school violence, rather. I want to recognize the victims, their family and friends, and the entire community uh, in each of those areas and around the country. I mean, this is something that has hit home around the country, particularly as we see a lot of uh, recent an uptick in threats around our community. And so I want to take a moment and, and have a moment of silence just to recognize and, and share our, our thoughts with those uh, family and friends and victims uh, in those communities. Thank you. As we move forward tonight and, uh, and through what's left of this year too, I want to take just a second to encourage calm in our community. Um, these tragedies have unfortunately, I think, brought forth the sad reality that anything can happen to anyone at any time. And we do our best and we do what we can to prevent violence in any of our schools at large, uh, but I think the first way that we combat this is to remain calm ourselves, to be examples um, to the children, to our students, to the people around us, um, and that we talk with our kids, uh, whether it's your kids or, or kids that you may know, that you talk to them about what's going on and you discuss with them in an age-appropriate way uh, what's going on in the community ask them what they see and what they think and what they think it means and how it makes them feel and try and understand and get them to talk about it so that it's less scary. Uh, last week I had uh, my own son called me crying from STEM middle school as the threat came in uh, that there was a potential that someone was potentially going to come into the school 
and do harm to the students. And I just happened to be pulling up to the building to drop some paperwork off, and he was texting me at the same time, and then just happened to call me, and he was crying, and please come get me. And I just thought to myself, you know, how awful it must, not only how awful it must feel, but what a responsibility we have to really talk with our kids about this and what it means and how we can calm them down and be examples ourselves. Um, so I just want to encourage that and to, and to remind them that if they do see something, to say something, but also instill in them the responsibility that they have to handle those things responsibly and to report them responsibly. You know, we found out at the STEM middle school incident that that was one that started on social media. It came out of Pennsylvania. It somehow made its way to one of our students and then flew like wildfire around the school because everybody has to share that via social media rather than sharing it with the people that can do something about it to protect our kids. So I think we really need to think before we share, um, and we need to teach our kids to think before we share and, and tell them what an awesome responsibility uh, those phones and those iPods and whatever they have in their hands are, um, but through it all to remain calm and just to talk to them. And I just want to share that. Um, and I, and I will be quiet with that and open it up for community and school reflection. I just have one one uh, comment. Uh, I like I think maybe for us as uh, Akron Public Schools uh, to present our our emergency plans as to what we do so that the public is aware of what goes on and how we look at uh, the safety of our students and our staff. So maybe we can get an update so that the community will know uh, what we actually do. It's not that we don't we sit back and we just wait for something to happen. But we do have a plan that uh, we go, uh, we use during during the time of the emergency. So that's a request that I would like to have covered there. Thank you. Thank you. Did you have anything for community and school reform? No, no, no. <laughs> Anybody else like to share? I had the opportunity to go to uh, juvenile court, uh, not for anything uh, that anyone had done or I did or family did, but we had the opportunity to, it was, uh, Women's History Month along with African American History Month and uh, I was privileged to represent the board and represent myself because one of our former board members was being recognized, Helen Arnold. And uh, I had the privilege of serving with Helen Arnold and uh, I was asked to say a few words uh, with the family as they gathered and <coughs> unveiled a wonderful uh, uh, banner of her service to the community. And for those who did not know uh, Mrs. Arnold, uh, she was a servant of the people. She rose up with the, with the masses of people uh, who encouraged her to serve on the board and to provide stellar leadership. And because of that, of course, uh, tribute to her and our school system is Ellen Arnold, uh, CLC. Uh, but she her sister, her family, contribute in a mighty way. Uh, and she encouraged those who are on the board to be active in OSBA, active in Q, active in the uh, Black Caucus, which she was a co-founder. Uh, so she was very, very active uh, in uh, the work that we uh, do here. So uh, I had great uh, privilege uh, to just pause for a moment recognize her stewardship uh, on the board, stewardship in the community. And I want to thank Judge Teodosio and then my daughter and the staff there for, for that privilege. I didn't know if you had those things for sharing. Thank you. I have questions. All of us were um, in attendance. <laughs> for the state of the schools, and I wanted to commend the superintendent on such a great job. Um, we just wrapped up the In the Round series for our middle schools and high schools. Hopefully you got to get to at least one of those. Those are always great fun every year, I guess, for the, the one that was for prior to the round. I wanted to thank the East High Alumni Association for what they do for East High School. They held their annual fundraising dinner um, a week or so ago, and uh, it was one of the biggest ones they've ever had. I think they were completely sold out. And uh, it was a great evening. There were lots of people having a great time. Um, I've made 
Um, Dr. Dr. Ellen McWilliams Woods very jealous because <laughs> I got to meet, talk to, take selfies and video with Senator Cory Booker, and she has. Uh, I think she's speaking to me still, but uh, <laughs> um, he did an amazing job at the My Brother's Keeper Community Forum. I know there are many of us who were there for that on a on a kind of yucky President's Day. It made a, it made for a bright spot, and SEI did a, a wonderful job of of that. But also the community discussions were quite good. I know uh, Carla was there leading one, and um, Ellen was. She wants to go to schools. I was there with Jonathan Greer as well. So um, just really great conversations and lots of gathering of information for that. Another great event that I would love to see some of our other schools emulate was Mason CLC had an ice cream social and art sale. I have some lovely art pieces that I bid on in a silent auction that are waiting for me right now. Um, and I can't wait to get my hands on them. So kudos to them for thinking outside the box. It was really an interesting and fun event. You got to go around with post-it notes, and the, for the artwork that you liked, you could write a little note of encouragement um, and just stick it on those pieces that were in the hallway. And then there was the whole section that you could bid on as well. Plus, the staff was there, that they were fantastic serving really good ice cream. So you, you can't go wrong with that. And. Um, just another thing to commend uh, staff on and just our students was um, I got to, uh, on behalf of my, my day job, I got to be over at uh, Kenmore, High, uh, Kenmore Garfield for their culinary program to hold a lunch meeting and Ms. Wolf was there as well. And we, um, we got to have lunch. So I would encourage board members, when you are planning a work lunch, what a fantastic way to not only show off our schools, but also to give the students a real chance to um, to serve someone from the outside. They they were great. Lunch was at a salad bar that was top notch, um, and uh, I got to have a gr really great meeting. They're going to be a, an integral part of this event that I have coming up. But um, I will not hesitate to hold lunches lunch meetings that I have at our schools after that experience. So I would encourage other board members to um, consider that. Consider going to Bukdol or going to East. And just give them a heads up, you're coming, and go have some lunch. Yeah, it's good food and great experience for our students. And, you know, the folks that had never been were blown away. So that's a nice thing. I'll take a turn here. You go, yeah, go Okay. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> we were at. Uh, was it My Brother's Keeper as well? State of the Schools, wonderful program. Uh, Akron Roundtable had a very interesting speaker mm -hmm. this time, Dr. Dr. Gregory Vincent from Hobart and Williams <coughs> Colleges. And he talked about his time on uh, the University of Texas campus. Uh, in the context of uh, historical statues, and those statues that came out of the Civil War, and it was interesting, a part that you don't hear about, I thought it was very interesting, but he, he talked about, you know, part of the conversation on what, what to do with those had revolved around the fiduciary duty that that board had to the people who uh, donated the money for those statues, and they had to take that into consideration. It wasn't just about, you know, the negative part of that, and they have to consider the the artwork and things of that nature as well. It was very interesting. It was he, he really got into some detail on what happens in those conversations. Um, let's see. I went to the Trio program once again. A very good program. Uh, they did talk about uh, one, uh, I guess, problematic thing from the standpoint, funding standpoint. They talked about that I think last year as well. But uh, those funds are in jeopardy. Uh, they asked people to reach out uh, to their congressional members and Senate members regarding the funds that keep uh, uh, that program going for the less fortunate to get them involved in, in campus and college and be able to you know just imagine themselves on a college campus. Uh, let's see, uh, Bookle PTA went to that meeting, my first meeting as Bookle Cluster Liaison. Uh, they, they have a very active PTA there. Uh, I've been involved in other PTAs at the high school level and sometimes it's a struggle to get two or three people there and they actually uh, had students there, teachers there. Sometimes the struggle to get the teachers in the PTA part coming, uh, but they had active teachers in their PTA as well. So 
Uh, and then uh, staying on the Bookful thread, I went to the City Series uh, Boys Basketball Championship. It was Ellett versus Bookful. It was an awesome game. Ellett ended up victorious, but uh, you know, I guess everybody, it's, victor it's victory for anybody to get to a championship game, and unfortunately, there's a winner and loser when it comes to championship games. Uh, let's see. Went to the Torchbearers 15th uh, anniversary program. Uh, I've, I've gone, I think that's the third time in a row I've gone. I bring that up simply because it's something I noticed when I'm sitting in the audience. Uh, one past president, Michael Wilson, who spoke, lives in Akron, works in Akron. Mm -hmm. Immediate past president, uh, actually, Nicole Mullet, yeah, she, is she immediate? No, she was before Michael. Michael's immediate past president, but uh, Nicole Bumblett lives in Akron, works in Akron. Current president, Hillary Negi, lives in Akron, works in Akron. Uh, vice president, and uh, I guess typically they move into the presidency seat, Sam Caldwell, lives in Akron, works in Akron, just bought a house in Akron, as Hillary just bought a house in Akron. Uh, Jessica Sherrick, who spoke as well, lives in Akron, works in Akron. Um, so, you know, those, in my mind, the people in Torchbearers, and I, I joke to people of that age, they don't know what I'm talking about when I talk about the JCs or the Junior Chamber of Commerce, but, uh, you know, that's that's what that group, in my mind, has replaced here in the city of Akron since that doesn't exist anymore. But those are the people we need to keep in mind because those are the future leaders of Akron. They're the people who are going to be sending their children to the city of Akron public schools. As the schools go, so goes the city, and as the city goes, so goes the school. So it's important to keep those connections and make those connections. And uh, just sort of on a light, lighthearted note, it, it was interesting when uh, they introduced all the school board members that evening. And uh, first they introduced the president, Patrick Bravo, big round of applause. Tim Miller, sort of meh. You know, and then they got to they got to Morgan, and you know the the roof raised off the house there at the Tangier that evening. So that was that was interesting and fun to see as well. So, um, well, we must say why, right? Because Morgan was also was a member of Porch on our board, as and you remember Porch Bears as well. Yes. Mm -hmm. Lives in Akron, works in Akron. So. Better. <laughs> I just wanted to go go back to trio program and how the young lady who is speaking Asia. No, I don't remember the last okay. name. Anyway, she, she works for uh, for uh, Judge, Bro. Judge Bro, um, yeah. and Judge Bro was in attendance uh, as a support system uh, for her, and um, she's uh, going to law school, and she's gonna. See, be her mentor all the way through law Asia school. Mixon. Asia Mixon. Okay. So uh, she had gone through the TRIO program, so it was really nice how they utilized the students who have been a product of the program to be speakers for the, the class that's currently going through the program to encourage them, and then in addition to that, mentors. So it, it was just nice to see that um, she came through there and she's uh, doing a great job, not because she didn't have a lot of uh, failures as far as trying to get uh, a job or different things, and she explained how she went through a, like about a half a dozen or more no's before she got a yes, so she was encouraging the students, you know, don't give up, you know, uh, be intentional and, you know, have your, your plans laid out and don't abandon them no matter what happens, continue to persevere and uh, and you will, you know, find yourself uh, in an open door space. So that was good. Uh, we did uh, our partnership, the Career Academy partnership with Kent State. But we were, mostly all of us were there uh, for that. So that was uh, a wonderful experience to see them partner with our Career Academies here. And they're going to be, uh, the school is going to be Firestone uh, CLC that they will be in partnership with. So that was one of many to come, probably. <laughs> uh, which is a good thing. I mean, you know, people love us, you know, so uh, sometimes we don't, you know, get the good press, but we're getting good press when it comes to our career academy, so we, we enjoy that, and we enjoy the momentum, and then the community just 
coming forward and uh, wanting to be a part of such a great, great, great initiative that's going to be so helpful to so many of our African public school students. So that's all I wanted to add. Um, I just want to say thank you very much to board members and staff who helped me and offered to help me get oriented, learn technology, understand language. <laughs> so I really, really appreciate that. And um, I just wanted to share a couple things. Um, one of the ways I'm also trying to orient myself is just to start meeting with students and parents and community folks. And I met with a teacher um, who's on maternity leave right now from ECLC over coffee earlier today and um, learned a ton in that hour. We talked about mentorship and student behavior stuff and STEM, she's a science teacher, um, social services for students. It was a fascinating conversation, so I'm excited to do more of that. I also um, got a last minute opportunity to jump on and listen to a call with uh, State Representative Reinecke, who's been working on House Bill 512, which um, is creating this Department of Learning and Achievement that oversees primary, secondary, and post-secondary education. And I got the sense on that phone call that he is pushing a very aggressive timeline. And um, so it, I'm excited for us as a board to talk more about that. It sounded like there were lots of pros, but also some particularly thorny things. The governor would now appoint that person versus the Board of Education, and it strips a lot of the State Board of Education's Responsibility. So it was exciting to learn more about that. I also have the bill analysis from the Ohio Legislative Service Commission. If anybody wants to see that, we can circulate it around and I can send it out as a PDF as well. And um, then the last small thing, um, Ohio State Board Association has been incredibly helpful with new board orientation. I've been trying to watch as many of those webinars as I can watch. <laughs> Um, the service learning one I thought was especially interesting and I'd love to learn more about that and how we think about that as Akron Public. A lot of that was not necessarily community service but a community orientation where students use what they're learning in the classroom to actually help solve problems in the community. So fascinating. I also have an executive summary from that webinar if anybody's interested in looking at that too. So thank you everybody so much. So basically, she's done nothing to get ready. Just <laughs> need you to step up. Well, great, and welcome to your first meeting. And before we go any further, I'll just say hi to Debbie Walsh, who's sitting out there, our former colleague. Always nice to see someone still. Always nice to see someone still engaged and willing to come see what what we're doing. Okay, with that, communications and recognitions. I know we have Mr. Tommy Bruno here, and we have a resolution uh, to rename the Musical Live program to honor Marilyn Stroud. Um, so tonight we're recognizing the dedication and commitment of a former board employee and a WAPS 91.3 FM volunteer, Marilyn Stroud. Uh, board members were asked to allow and support the Summit WAPS 91.3 FM. I feel like I have to say that every time, like I have to say the call letters when you're on the radio. Is that right? Yeah, 91.3 FM. Uh, but we've been asked to officially change the Music Alive program, a phenomenal program. Uh, it's an instrument donation program to the Marilyn Stroud Music Alive program. Marilyn dedicated 29 years of service to special needs children in Akron Public Schools and upon retirement, another 10 years to managing the station's Music Alive program. To date, the Music Alive instrument program has secured and donated over 400 musical instruments to students in Akron Public Schools, most recently, I believe, your violin or something. Well, hopefully more since that, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, Marilyn O'Brien Stroud died February 8, 2018. Mm -hmm. She is survived by her husband, Bob Stroud, her sons, Brian and Steve, and three grandchildren. So we're pleased to present this resolution to the Stroud family. Whereas Marilyn Stroud was employed by the Akron Board of Education beginning in 1974 and served as a special education teacher at several schools from 1983 until her retirement in 2006. And whereas after she retired, Marilyn Stroud dedicated her time, energy, and charisma to the WAPS FM radio station and the Music Alive Instrument Donation Program. And whereas Marilyn Stroud has been passionate and dedicated about keeping music alive for the next generation, 
and has assisted in, in acquiring and distributing over 400 musical instruments to Akron Public School students. And, whereas Akron Public Schools wishes to honor the devotion and the commitment made by Marilyn Stroud to the radio station, to music education, and to the students in Akron by changing the name of the WAPS-FM Music Alive Instrument Donation Program to the Marilyn Stroud Music Alive Program, now therefore be it resolved by the Akron Board of Education the board members approve of changing the name of the Music Alive program in honor of Miss Marilyn Stroud, and that the board wishes to convey their condolences to the family of Marilyn Stroud by way of this resolution. Do we have a motion? So moved. Second. Okay. We have a motion and a second. Any questions or discussion? Would you like to come up and say anything? Well, I just, um, can you step up and first say something about Marilyn and the program and its importance? So, the first time I, I ever met Marilyn, it was because my predecessor, Dr. Childs, had said, the first day I was in, in, on the job, you really need to meet this woman. She's doing amazing things for our kids. And, uh, and anyway, so we walk over to the radio station, we hit the button, and of course she comes out in her high heels and you know what she was really known for. Um, she was just a, a marvelous, bright person. Um, she lit up every room she was in. Um, she cared only about getting music, uh, music in our classrooms, getting instruments in our kids' hands. Um, she cared only about kids all the time. That was what her, her whole life was about. Um, and I just don't even know that she knows how much she, how much of a difference she's made in students' lives. Um, one of our own board members gave her violin, and, and now is serving a student at North. And that's just one of a thousand stories out there because of because of this woman. So uh, Marilyn was a, an amazing. Yeah, and I'll just I'll just add that a quote from JFK that um, one person can make a difference and everyone should try. And that's Helen Arnold, you know, she got her hands dirty and got in there and tried. And, and um, by all accounts, Marilyn was a wonderful woman of great loyalty to her family and her community. And, you know, she's one of those people that just showed up at the station and just loitered. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, you just, those kind of people that just want to give their time and energy. And um, the programs flourished because of her. And um, we're really, you know, honored to be here and privileged that that name will carry on. And the family thanks all of you. Thank you so much. Any other questions or discussion? We want to thank Ms. Stroud and her family for sharing her with us for so many years. And if there are no other questions or discussion, uh, we have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right. The motion passes, and this is for Maryland's family. Thank you for sending these to us. Thank you so much. Next on our agenda, improving the customer experience in Akron Public Schools. We have a presentation from Ms. Carvis. I'm going to bring up that presentation here. Yeah, <laughs> it works. Good evening. Good, Good evening. evening. Thank you for allowing us this time. Can you see me okay? Mark, Mark, Mark. I'm going to try to be lively, but I am experiencing a few problems, okay? That's a little better. Thank you. I'm uh, happy to come today to give you just a few highlights um, and share some things that we're doing around creating positive customer experiences. But before I do, I want to distinguish between the use of the word customer experiences versus customer service. Intentional use of the word experience. Why do you think I did that? That's a question. <laughs> Just how do we distinguish between customer experience and customer service? I intentionally use the word experience because it is more about the way we want folks to feel 
and what they take away when they interact with our facilities, our staff, our programs, right? Mm -hmm. Service is kind of what we do. So we want to be focused on how we want people to feel when they interact with us, our facilities, our staff, our programs. So we are located, as far as this conversation goes, in <laughs> District focus area two, implementing unique strategic initiatives and in buildings to enhance learning conditions. And we also hit on focus area three, collaboration and engagement with focused connections with parents and families. So creating positive experiences for our students, our families, and our community. So gonna hit on a few highlights with those three groups in mind. Want to talk about the work that Andrew Zaccardi is doing in school climate. Our superintendent had the vision to develop a school climate office to work on some things proactively to improve the conditions around welcoming classrooms, school offices, and facilities in our building. Tonight I wanted to share the work of the school safety team members in 14 elementary schools in our district. And you see them listed there. Their work is all evidence-based and is around those four key areas. Restoring students who may have disruptions in the classroom and behavior issues that require some redirecting, refocusing, having conversations with students, parents, and the principal to reduce the amount of time kids are spending outside of their classroom. Reentry conferences that are coordinated in collaboration with the principal, the parents, and the teacher for those students who do miss time out of school. What is done in the interim? to bring them back so that they understand why they're out, what they can do to improve their behavior, and how do we get you back into the classroom with the, the least amount of time lost in instruction. Positive participation is an incentive-based opportunity for students who are on track, who are making gains, who are improving giving them an opportunity to meet with mentors, fun time during recess, um, talking with older kids from other schools, just active, positive participation. And then the cafeteria and recess support because we know that those are hot button times where negative behaviors can take place. Bullying, kids having fights, conversations going on. So. This work being led by Mr. Zaccardi with the vision of the superintendent to try to be more proactive with our students as it relates to behavior. And then you heard our superintendent mention the PAX Good Behavior Game at the State of the Schools Dress earlier this month. There are currently 74 APS teachers trained in this model. This is funded by the Alcohol, Drug, and Mental Health Board as a partnership between our district and something our superintendent felt was valuable for our students and staff as well, and the Ohio Department of Mental Health. It is an evidence-based drug prevention program that teaches self-regulation skills to kids. So this is a little different than classroom management. This is teaching our students how to have a greater sense of emotional intelligence, right? <laughs> Controlling their emotions, understanding how to regulate themselves, and how the way they present in class and in interactions with others may cause issues. And now there is a new funding opportunity available for preschool, and that discussion is being had with the superintendent along with Pat Cronin at our ELP program. And after the My Brother's Keeper um, dialogue last week where Allison, um, Allison Lee 
share that in preschool now. There's such a behavior concern mm -hmm. at the Head Start level for students that they feel that there could be a great amount of interest there in taking part in this kind of training for their staff as well because many of those youngsters do come to us and so it would benefit us to also partner in that way to reduce the number of uh, behavior incidences we are seeing with young people. For our families, I wanted to share with you the article I read by Yvette Latunde because she listed in there the four top complaints parents have and they mirrored all of the conversations we have by telephone, by walk-in visit, or in the community, and things we hear when we're engaging with our residents. Not receiving clear information about what students are learning. Finding out about problems when it's too late to intervene or improve the situation. Hearing from schools only when there are problems, and I'll talk more about what we're doing with our family liaisons around that. And then communicating about problems without offering the plan to address them. So I thought it was interesting that we pretty much mirrored what her research said. And I see this as an opportunity to improve our delivery of service and create those positive experiences. If these are the things that are the top four concerns, then let's address those as part of our work. And so with our family liaisons now, 17 in elementary schools across the district listed there. We are working with school teams to address chronic absenteeism as part of the work with House Bill um, 410. They join the school attendance teams to assist in making the four, three, I think it's three, excuse me, three, excuse me, three meaningful contacts to families so that we have a reason to uh, identify absenteeism for students. Oftentimes there is no one else in the building that can do that kind of work. So making sure that these liaisons become a part of that House Bill 410 attendance intervention team is becoming really important. And then coordinating programs linked to learning for families and connecting them to community resources. I wanted to say that we have worked with um, Summit Education Initiative to develop an online portal to track the time spent by liaisons in their buildings on this kind of work. Thanks to our school improvement office, our uh, superintendent, assistant superintendent for approving this kind of work in our district for our families. It's been around for a long time, but we've been more focused on redesigning and being more intentional about the work that they're doing in buildings. And most recently, through our superintendent's leadership with the United Way of Southern County, we are a part of the Students at the Center Family Wraparound Supports Initiative. Lots of discussions taking place right now about what that will look like in our district. How we will collaborate with other agencies in the community, how we will staff that particular type of program and service. Uh, we are right now pursuing uh, national grants, local opportunities, to develop that kind of programming to support our students and our families and continue to remove those non-academic barriers. <laughs> if you've reached out to any of our staff recently, you will have seen the customer service link at the bottom of the email signatures. Looks like this. Just a few questions. Shout out to our IT department and Howard Lawson and his people because I bug them all the time to help me set up these things. But there are just four questions that our central office departments now have at the bottom of their email when they interact with both our internal and our external customers so that we can get feedback 
and use this as an opportunity to have a dialogue and a conversation with our team members so that we can improve our connections. If folks would like to be called back, we have the ability to do that. They can leave their name and number and a call is made. Every department head around the room gets the feedback on their surveys from their department and their staff. I will tell you that all of the surveys completed to date, about 200 since we wrote this out fully in November, have more than 95% positive responses. Overwhelmingly positive responses about the interaction our people are having with the community. Are there any questions for me? Yes. Um, out of those individuals who called and did the survey, how many of do you know how many were in those uh, clusters of schools that they had, you had your liaisons in? I have to go back to the database that feeds, uh, the database that is fed into from each completed survey mm -hmm. to look at where they're coming from. It, it doesn't give personal mm -hmm. identifying information right. about the person. Mm -hmm but maybe there's a way to see. Yeah. They're coming from all quadrants of the city right. for various reasons, both, again, internal customers mm -hmm. and external. Right. It would be interesting to see how many have improved because of those liaisons being there. That would be interesting. Yeah, I mean, we, we could probably tie it back to some kind of correlation, but I think it's, it's the sum total of all of the efforts right. taking place in our district from the front office staff all the way to the custodian right. services yeah. to ensure that our buildings have what right. they need at every entry and touch yeah. point. So we could probably do some of that, but I would guess that it's kind of the sum total of everything that we're doing in the district. So I, there's a handout. I have helpers. Once you, the board, approve the transformation of our school center, college, and career academies, we have the discussion with our superintendent. He approved us moving forward to begin the dialogue with staff groups around these 16 common building expectations. And I will tell you that. Mr. James and Assistant Superintendent McWilliams Woods were all over, all over. Started meeting with folks, pulling staff groups together, getting people to agree that these are some basic level expectations we want across our district in every building and every department. And it was not a top down. Thing. These were also adopted in every customer service training, customer experience training we've held over the past two years by all of our staff groups as well. There is not anyone that has disagreed that these should not be very basic, common level expectations. Now we know moving into 10 North Main means something different and We'll do that work as well once we're all in one building and we create even better experiences for our community. But we thought that this was a real uh, feather in our superintendent's hat to our college and career academies as it relates to facilities and how we engage and what we expect of our staff was important to push through our district. So I thank you for that. And I think that's it for me. It's short and sweet today, but I'll take questions. Yeah, I've got a couple questions. Back to, back to the customer service survey. Uh, when is that going to be reported out to us as far as statistics? I know it's been going on for probably Since six November? Months. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Any I, early? Would, I am very open to bringing information at the next opportunity I have for an update. We want to give it time to be used. It is just on email, so we want to get enough information across the eight departments that have it at the bottom of their emails right now. Yeah, I don't think all eight departments started in November, did they? Or? Not that, no. Yeah, it was a roll.
end of September. And then by the time we got to November, most were on. I've got a question under school climate, the PAC's good behavior day. It, it shows pre-K through grade three. Yeah. But it, it talks about evidence-based drug prevention program. Mm -hmm. that, yeah. I'm reading that correctly. You are. Okay. Yeah, the earlier the better is the mindset. Um, the State Department of Mental Health and Drug Addiction, as well as the Adam Board, don't currently have evidence for the middle and high school work that they're doing. There is evidence for PACs at the pre-K through third grade level. Is this, is this like a D.A.R.E. program or a curriculum? No, yeah. the curriculum is not about drugs or substance abuse. It is about self-regulation in identifying those issues that take you over the edge and would lead you to negative behaviors. Okay. That's where the research comes in. If we can teach kids how to self-regulate, then they don't need to self-medicate. Okay. And are the 70, 74 teachers spread out evenly across our grade schools? And how do you, probably how have, every... you know, do you recall, maybe 11 buildings that have the huge majority of that 74 okay. to date. And so every student in that building gets a taste of this program? Teachers who use this in their classrooms. Okay. So it is not whole building, whole district to scale yet. So do the teachers volunteer to get trained? They and do. Do we know they use it after they're trained? The Summit County uh, Educational Service Center provides that kind of data collection support. So they send people into schools to track the use of the PACS Good Behavior Day. Excuse me. And they're actually counting the number of disruptions that happen in those classrooms where teachers are using that particular method. Compared it to classrooms that aren't using that. Okay, interesting. Um, back to the family engagement piece. And now I asked the very same question when Dan Rambler did a you know, similar program on the family engagement and things that are available for our parents. Yeah. And I guess I'll just, uh, I ask the same question. Any teeth and and to getting our parents to participate in these voluntary programs? I mean, how do we do that? Well. It's an ongoing, long-term, consistent effort. So families require relationship building, right? It's not enough to just offer and expect people to come. They have to be brought to the table to decide what the services, programs, and offerings should be first. And then it's ongoing, regular relationship building with our families to identify whatever barriers might exist that keep them from participating. And then building on each opportunity we have one step at a time. There is no quick and easy answer to parent engagement. It really is one family at a time, one student at a time. In fact, the students at the center model is all about putting the student and family in the center and almost triaging that particular unit one at a time to ensure that you're actually meeting the needs for that particular family. So the, the, the group approach to service delivery for families is probably going by the wayside because the problems are too complex now. There is no one size fits all model of engagement across the board. It's deep work, it really is. It's not often respected as such, but in our district, we value it. And so the superintendent has, has seen enough to recognize that it's important to go down this road, even if it takes us going a little deeper 
with more resources to do it. Yeah, everybody realizes it's challenging. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm going to ask probably continuation. How do we bring those parents to the table? What do we do to, to get them to the table so we can get in and deeper with them? Yeah, I mean, if they have to be invited, mm -hmm. real opportunities to engage in conversation, to make decisions, oftentimes at places where they are, and that might not always be for everyone at the school, um, and really working at it and using the voice of people that have a connection with the communities and the neighborhoods where people are coming from so they're more likely to listen mm -hmm. and hear. Because sometimes the call from me is not the right call. Right. Mm -hmm. Not the one they want to hear mm -hmm. from. It may be the neighbor down the street who is volunteering every day who has all of the inside information and is willing to hold my hand and walk me into the school and help me access and navigate through those opportunities. It's, it's yeah. deep work. It's yeah, because I'm just trying to see how we, how do we branch out and grab, touch, at least touch as many as we can so we can try to get them to the table. That was, that was okay. And Thank for you. some people, it takes making those home visits. Mm -hmm. sitting, I mean, Mary's staff will tell you they spend time, boots on the ground, knocking on doors, having conversations on the front porch at the library. I see staff showing up at other events and churches and other places where people are. It is not always at the school right. that engagement has to take place. We just want to make the connection. Um, just wanted to follow up on a couple of things really quick. Um, I know there's some studies that show that first drug and alcohol use is at 10. So, yeah, so it's it's not too early to start interventions that get self-awareness going um, because 10 is young, but it's true. Um, I, I love this piece. As when I first came on the board, my first committee was, what was it? Was it customer service? Is that what we used to call it? So, um, you know, this it's fantastic to see this. Um, I'd love to see more about how this engagement's going to roll out. I, I know, I, I remember we brought someone in and talked about appropriate signage being positive. Instead of saying, don't do this, telling mm -hmm. them what they do do and things like that. So uh, I'm thrilled for this. Yeah. My question, question, was about um, the school climate and the restorative practices mm -hmm. with the safety teams. Is So the negative behavior's already mm -hmm. occurred. How much of these four are mandatory, and how many of them have to be approved by, say, a parent? So we all know that we, have, we all have perfect children. They never make any mistakes. Um, so, and that, or that's sometimes what we go in believing, right? So if you believe little Johnny's perfect, mm -hmm. do, you buy, do, do you have to buy into these four as a parent, or are they basically mandatory for you to um, basically have your way back in? So in schools where it's working well, there is excellent relationships with those families to have the discussion, and staff, to have the discussion about how these four work for each of the cases that are presented for connection to the school safety team person. Yes, parents at the table, absolutely. But I haven't heard that that's an issue in buildings where it's really working well. So they can't say, it's, no, he's not going to do restorative, this restorative practice. He just wants to go back to class, or he just well, wants to be. I, I, I haven't heard anyone really argue with the fact that this is yet another opportunity to teach a young person about what other pathway they could have taken? Okay. What other options and alternatives did I have before it landed me outside of my educational experience? Okay. Right there, there's always a different way that they can go before it lands them outside of accessing learning time. And I, I haven't heard that that's been an issue because okay. Every parent wants to ensure that their kids are maximizing the time on task in the classroom versus 
outside of the classroom in an in-school suspension or some other kind of option where they're missing out mm -hmm. on what's happening in the class. I really haven't heard that that's an issue. If it is, I'll learn more as we go on with this. But it's still early enough and we're still collecting data on the use and at their effectiveness in the schools where they are. So we're still pretty new to it, but I just, I haven't heard that that's been an issue. I guess the, the, I was going to follow up on Sister Mansfield's uh, question. What is restorative justice? Mm. Restorative <laughs> justice. Yeah. It, it's been thrown out there because I have one understanding of what it is. And so, restorative yeah. practices. Yeah. Restorative or practices. restorative justice. Whichever. Yeah. What, what is it? Yeah, it's the new evidence based approach to providing kids alternatives to suspension, out of school suspension, expulsion, correcting negative pe uh, behaviors and giving them other options to, um, what's the word I'm looking for, other options to make right what they've done wrong, to redeem themselves, and but to put them back to a place of wholeness. Because we know that out of school suspension exposure have negative impact on a student's self-esteem, their perception of themselves, their perception of their ability to do well in school. So where at all possible, we want to restore them to whole, but also give them an opportunity to make amends for bad behavior and provide alternatives. Okay, that's the part. Yeah. My child has offended or done something to another student. Mm -hmm. So the process from what I see in my mind my child then learns that, that that was not the correct behavior, but that's not enough. Now I've got to go to the, the student that I've offended and make some kind of amends. And your teacher. And the teacher. And if it's a school and issue, it's a maybe school there issue too. To school mm -hmm. to find a way to make amends publicly, privately, whatever mm -hmm. the process is. Mm -hmm. Is that working have we yeah, well, seen yeah. that working do yeah. does, does everyone in the system understand that's the goal mm -hmm. and how we're going to get there because we have teachers saying one thing mm -hmm. or what their understanding is of that students another we have juvenile court that comes into our buildings and peace circles what's their understanding what are we trying what's the goal because right now Mr. Miller, no, right, not right now, but he's going to be talking about what he's going to be doing, mm -hmm. what we're going to be doing in that area, galvanizing the community, etc. But if we don't know, if we don't have it right in here, you know, and we're not putting it together here, how can we expect people from the outside that we're going to be encouraging to come in and help us, our teachers, our staff, if we don't have it right here? We've got it on this piece of paper. But if we don't know what we're doing in here, then it's not going to go right. I agree. Before uh, Mr. Miller asks his questions, I want to back up your question about, I want to back it up. I think uh, I think it's a good conversation. Uh, and I actually heard that a very similar question with the board earlier this evening. It was included in a list of um, just questions that I have floating in my mind about what is restorative justice? What does restorative justice look like? Uh, because I think in theory, for sure, who would argue with redemption? I mean, there's power in redemption, right? Especially te teaching our students the power of redemption and responsibility and accepting and doing something to redeem oneself. But I think in practice, what is restorative justice? What does that look like? Yeah. Do we have all of the tools and the resources and the things that are necessary to do it and do it effectively 
so that it's not just a term of art that we're using. Mm -hmm. And then, lastly, is it effective? In places where we've implemented, does it work? And that's not, those are all questions we can't answer here tonight, but I just want to back that up because I think it's a whole continuum of questions. And if we're going to say we're doing restorative justice, I'm all for that. I, again, I think there's power in redemption. But are we, what does that look like in school? And it's probably different for elementary than it is for middle and high school. And what does that actually look like in the schools? Do, do the teachers and the buildings and the principals, do they have everything they need to do it effectively? And then is it working? Yeah. I know you have a question. <coughs> well, I have Somebody wants to dovetail on that. Can I get in on the first question? Oh, okay, go ahead. First, I have something before I get clouded over. <laughs> so we have this work taking place in 14 elementary schools only. That's the first piece of this right now. And so data is being collected for these 14 elementary schools. And here in our district, it is these four focuses that make up our restorative practice work. Restoring students, correcting the behavior, teaching new skills, getting them back on track. Re-entry conferences, positive participation, and then the hot button, hot spot areas of cafeteria and recess time. So that's what it is in our district in terms of the work. Now the data that I saw just last Wednesday with Andrew Sicardi, I haven't even had a chance to share it with the superintendent. I'm on the assistant superintendent schedule in a couple of weeks. There is very strong data that is showing a correlation to out of school suspensions in these buildings where these are worked to fidelity. We're still new though in this work. We are not district-wide, we're not all elementary schools, we're not even at the middle and high school yet with this work, with this team of folks. So very early stages of this work in our district, but seeing positive impact, very strong data laid on top of how much time we're spending in each of these areas and out of school suspension for these buildings. Does that make sense? Yes, question. Would you, I was gonna ask, uh, would you consider uh, self-regulating as part of the, the restore portion for elementary school students? Like to teach them to self-regulate, uh, would, would that be part of that process? Well, the PACS Good Behavior Game is a teacher-driven initiative because you have to have a roster of kids that you deal with regularly in order to determine whether there are classroom disruptions that are taking place. Now, there are components of that that I'm sure are used and can be used across other partners like school safety teams, school providers, community-based providers that serve our students, daycare centers. There's probably some of that that can be shared and in other places. And that's one of the reasons I said that because I know it works like in a, in a pre-K setting mm -hmm. because I've seen evidence of that with family members, children, and things mm -hmm. like that the self-regulating uh, portion of it and how it's working. But one thing that's key and important, and you said it more than once, more than twice, relationships. Yeah. You cannot stress enough relationships. We have to develop relationships with those parents, like you said, to get them in. It may not take you, they might not want to hear from you, me, or any board member, but it might be the person down the street, it may be somebody at church, somebody they know and they trust, in order to bring them to the table. But you have to establish a relationship. We can't expect to go up to people and browbeat them into submission to what we want and we don't, we don't even halfway talk to them or have a relationship, find out even, you know, 
what they're all about or, or something about them. So that is so important in life, not just education, but it's, it's uh, monumental in education, but it's so important in life that those relationships are established because the results are gonna be more favorable across the board when you establish the proper relationships from the law enforcement and everything. And I'm sure the officer over there can uh, attest to how uh, you know effective it is in the schools and stuff, establishing relationships with the students and how you gain their respect in a different type of way. So I, I just thank you guys for your work. It's very challenging and it's, uh, it's very tedious you know, when you're dealing with parents, especially in our diverse district. You have all sorts of players that you try to bring to the table and it's gonna take different things for different people. So um, I just respect what you're doing and uh, I uh, just applaud you guys for the entire team that's working on this for what you're doing and I know it's going to take some time because this is this is a very intricate uh, in intricate um, initiative so it's going to take some time but from what you're saying at least we're 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 started and then things are, are changing you know it's on the social emotional side of the coin this is this is all of that non-instructional work, right, <coughs> that we also want to address. And thanks to the leadership of our superintendent, okay. assistant superintendent, we, we have some things in place that we're willing to take a look at to see if we can make it in that. Okay, sorry. What, what have we been doing in the middle schools and high schools then since we had this precipitous drop in suspensions four years ago? I, I'm not familiar with this at the middle and high school, it is not. And prior to Andrew Sicardi's assignment to me, in the middle and high school, we have school safety team members that are there to build relationships with students and to be a positive other adult there, but I don't know that there is a consistent evidence-based approach right now to how we deal with these four aspects at the middle and high school level. Dr. McWilliams Woods, Mark Black, Superintendent James. Nobody, you're gonna leave her hanging? <laughs> Would that be correct though? Yeah. No. I was just gonna the say younger you the better, right? Yeah. Teach them now so that when they matriculate into middle and high school, we don't have that concern. Patrick kind of hit on this here, but the, the difference between restorative justice, there's two different aspects, two different uh, sides. You got the juvenile justice side and you have the school side. So we have to look at what we're doing and make sure we don't confuse the juvenile justice yeah. and blend it in with the school because yeah. that's two different sides. You. So you have to leave the justice over here and focus on the school. Because if you don't, then you mix them. Now you got a whole bunch of things going, and nothing's going to work the right way. So we got to look at both sides. So we should be looking at the school aspects of it, which what we can do to help these students uh, and teachers, and then eventually, hopefully, the families as well. So uh, that's just part of the restorative justice. Yeah. But we got to we have to focus on the, the school right. aspect. Yeah. There's a lot of things going on, of course. Right. Yes. Oh, Mr. Bravo. Right. Sorry, one quick question. Um, topic changing. But if you think about the customer experience and defining who the customer really is, do you think there are opportunities for other buckets of customers outside the three? I know this is a lot on your plate, but things like potential students and families or things like internal customers, like teachers and staff? Absolutely. When I say internal, I'm talking about staff primarily. Mm -hmm. And lots of work done to analyze why customers leave, what do we do to get them back. Mark Williamson in the communications office doing more outreach and marketing in that area to the best of his ability to do so. And of course, the college and career academies being a real value added mm -hmm. in our community and an attraction, right? Recruit, retain, what's the third one? Recruit, attract, retain. Yes. Yes, absolutely. 
I'm just hitting on these three gotcha. tonight as part of a just highlighted update. I have, I have several thoughts and questions. One, um, unlike the staff who just left you hanging, I appreciate all of the hard work. I know your passion in this area, so um, so thank you to, to what Ginger was saying too. Thank you for um, all that you do. And we've seen even just in the six years that I've been on the board, um, just the effort that's gone behind really trying to be intentional and just thoughtful about how we um, interact with the community and about how we change the way we interact with the community as far as the, the positive customer experiences goes. Uh, so thank you for that. At some point, I would really love just to, you know, get back, play the broken record again and, or get back on my soapbox. I would love to see some thought around really uh, almost sort of in a way that you can see it almost publicly uh, coordinating some of those efforts that are going on between community and family engagement, marketing, uh, communications, public relations, involvement, uh, all of that just kind of really somehow, I don't know, because it's all about on the business side of things, aside from just creating a positive experience to me, it really is about getting butts in seats and keeping butts in seats, which is what you talked about, right? It's about attracting and retaining students um, and looking at enrollment, looking at, you know, things that we can measure to the conversion between a student or a family that may be interested in Akron Public Schools to are they actually coming to Akron Public Schools? Did mm -hmm. we convert them from interest to student in seat? Um, so I really love to see that at some point. I think from a business strategy side, Morgan, um, I just think that would be really powerful, and I love what you're doing. On here, I do have a question in what you provided. Uh, but let me ask the, the first one uh, first. Who we do sort of that on this, the, core, the common building expectations, I love this too. Shout I'm, out to Marsha. Marsha Pullman. I'm created with, that I'm marketing Lisa, for college and career academies. Brilliant. I think it's easy to read. It's easy to understand. It's easy to say, here's what we expect when we walk in a building. I love that. Um, do we test this out? Are we secret shopping? And yes. if so, yes. how do we address those? So Tim asked about the teeth on getting parents in the door. What's the teeth when there's a less than, uh, less than positive customer experience that someone witnesses? Yeah, so we do have uh, happy visitors to our facilities <laughs> who use that as a guide to look at where we are. And those discussions have been taking place between Andrew Sicardi and principals for the past year on where they are in their buildings around this work. And we've just started to have the discussions with our central office, in particularly as we prepare for 10 North May. Mm -hmm. So yes, we are using that, and we are auditing, if you will, where we are. And any plans for like student buy-in to this, mm -hmm. so that the kids feel really invested in their play, their expectations? Absolutely, right, Rach? <laughs> yeah, because there are pathways in college and career academies that would even allow students to be a part of these kinds of discussions. I, I would think yes, many opportunities. And monthly, Mr. James meets with a group of seniors from each high school, and they let him have it. <laughs> they are not shy. They share with him exactly what they feel about how they're experiencing their facilities, their teachers, their content, school lunches, sports, band equipment, transportation. Yeah, I think there are lots of opportunities for students. And this was great dialogue. I mean, I, I, I still have more. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's not over yet. Bring it. I, okay. Um, so I love this, but again, for me, there's, I, I want to, separating sort of the family engagement 
and community family engagement from like the supports that we're providing our students as far as uh, discipline at the beginning and then uh, the PAC stuff and all of that and how that relates to creating a positive customer experience. I get it's all within the context of school climate, I suppose. My, here's my question. In the top four complaints by parents, this, I assume this is the survey that we did because it's cited here. This is the one that you gave us the results for a while back? What I cited there was a research article which lists all the complaints gathered from school districts, so urban school ours. districts. Okay. I shared them because when I speak with John Dawson, when I have parents call our office, walk into our office, work with Deborah or student services, they are the same four complaints that I can categorize for the families who have issues that they bring to our attention. So here's my question then, tying that to going then to the, uh, after the top four complaints, we talk about kind of what we're doing. Mm -hmm. But some of them, I'm not sure, do they line up? So not receiving clear information about what concepts the students are learning, how does that line up? What, yeah, what's the response to that? Or finding out when it's too late, mm -hmm. what's the response? Because they don't, in my mind, they don't seem to necessarily line up, though they probably do. They do, because where I would say programs linked to learning for families, that isn't just about learning content, that's learning what you need to know about what's happening in school that's ensuring that you have good information about what kids are learning, the number one chief complaint. Clearly communicating with them what's happening in classrooms so that they understand and can support learning. Again, plans and addressing plans for behavior. Restorative work, again, how I have a problem with behavior, what are you doing to help me ensure that this doesn't happen to my student again? That is part of school climate work, right? So could have probably linked it a little clearer, mm -hmm. but it is it is all connected. I figured it was in there. I'm, yeah. So I had ten slides and I said ten minutes, and then <laughs> so I got ten slides and I got twenty minutes. I think the best thing that can happen is this kind of dialogue, right? That, that's the very best thing that can happen as you consider this kind of work, is to continue to have this kind of dialogue, real conversations. One last question. Do we get the community involved? I know we are all here, we talk about and discuss this, but how often do we get out in the community and discuss this here so that the community will understand and know and see what we're trying to do? Because that's, again, Patrick just said that too, that's how we're building a relationship, yeah. but if we're going to them and saying, okay, here's what we're doing and, 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 and gaining their input, yeah. then we're okay because so, a lot of times we, we can't just sit around here and this here and we do this here, we got to get out there in the middle of it and hear what's going on, hear what they have to say at times, then we can bring it back to the table along with what we have and now here's what we're hearing from the community. They're the ones who have the kids who are coming to the school. So we need to hear from them so we understand and know what's going on. So that that's part of it too. Is, is, is you, and you mentioned going out there, meeting them where they're at, being in the community, yeah. you know, and, and explaining it. Because I think we have to do a better job of teaching the community of what we're going and telling stories and telling our processes, our procedures and things yeah. of what we do so that they understand. Because the community really doesn't understand a whole lot of what's going on. Even now with the, the, the things that are going on with the shootings and so forth in school, yeah. People are asking, well, what are we doing? So we have to tell them, what is Akron Public School doing? I mean, we care about all the other school districts, but our primary responsibility is Akron Public Schools. So what are we doing here in Akron Public Schools? We have to get that out there to them so they understand and they know. If we don't, it's like spinning wheels in, in, in mud and you're going nowhere. And so, I could just add to that, too. It's, it's about hearing them and telling them what we're doing, but also like co-creating it with them. Yeah. The, 
you guys are going to get tired of me saying this, but people tend to support that which they help to create. Nobody's going to call their baby ugly, so what can we do to make sure everybody feels responsible for the creation of that baby? <laughs> yeah, I, and I think we have to do it more and more often, regularly and consistent. But just so you know, this work started with community teams. Mm -hmm. So we didn't get to those four practices as what we would focus right. on for restorative work without that community team led by Andrew to seek input. Parents, staff, community leaders, and others coming together. Same with these three focus areas for family liaison. It started with a community engagement team that met to look at, over the course of a year and a half, to really look at what kinds of concerns they had what they felt could be addressed, easily low-hanging fruit that we could work with. So we didn't get to this outside of the community, but I think we need to do it more. And it's really about being where people are as ambassadors so that they can hear from us as often as possible about what's going on. The more the better. And the more people who can speak that message, the better. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Next on the agenda, approval of the meeting minutes for the special meeting February 10th, 2018, regular meeting February 12th, 2018, and the two special meetings on February 17th and February 20th, 2018. Do we have a motion? So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any questions or discussions? Hearing none, roll call for you. Mr. Alexander? Yes. Mr. Taylor? Yes. Mr. Bravo? Yes. Mrs. Lasher? I'm just going to abstain since I was not at the meeting. Thank you. Excellent. Mrs. Mansfield? Yes. Mr. Miller? Yes. Reverend Walker? Yes. Superintendent's recommendation? Mr. President, I have before me for your consideration 25 personnel recommendations and one item on the personnel supplement. Uh, these recommendations are in proper form, and I move their approval. And before um, there's a, we entertain a motion, I'd like Patrick McVeigh to introduce one addition to our staff who's brought some backup with her tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Randy, if you could stand, please. Tonight, I'd like to introduce to you uh, Ms. Brandy Davis. Um, Brandy is a graduate of our own local high school. In 1994, she enrolled at the University of Akron with the intention to become a teacher and received her Bachelor's of Science degree in education and then later went back to the University of Akron where she obtained her Master's degree. She began working for Akron Public Schools in 1999 and became a, she taught English at the former Central Howard High School for five years and also served as their cheerleading advisor. She quickly moved up the ranks and in 2004 she became an assistant principal at the high school level. She served in that capacity at North High School, Central Howard High School, and at East High School. After seven years as an assistant principal, she became an elementary school principal and served in this capacity first at Rankin Elementary School and then at Schumacher Elementary School, where she remained through this year. <clears throat> Tonight, we are recommending that she be recommended for the principal position at the LeBron James I Promise School. Yeah. Yes, your turn. <laughs> thank you. Um, I would like to thank Superintendent James, Dr. McWilliams Woods, um, Michelle Campbell, and the LeBron James Family Foundation, as well as Human Resources and members of the Board of Education for entrusting me with the responsibility to lead the I Promise School. With a trauma informed curriculum that is truly embedded, a hopefully soon to be STEM designation status, and a true, complete wraparound support, not only for our students and for our families, the I Promise School will be a nationally recognized model of urban public school excellence, right here in Akron Public Schools. 
That deserves a round of applause. I would like to thank all of you for allowing me the opportunity to lead such a monumental task. And also, thank you so much for allowing me to walk in my purpose. Thanks again, and I will not let you down. Thank you. I think you better introduce your backup. <laughs> this is my number one cheerleader. She has never missed a parent-teacher conference and open house from kindergarten all the way up until now. This is my mother, Linda Davis. <laughs> <laughs> With that, do we have a motion on the personnel recommendation? Second. <laughs> we have a motion and a second on the personnel recommendations. Any questions or discussion? Hearing none, roll call, please. Mrs. Baylor? Yes. Mr. Bravo? Yes. Mrs. Lasher? Yes. Mrs. Mansfield? Yes. Abstaining on item 23. Can I take mine back? I was supposed to abstain too. <laughs> Y'all are all swept with the motion. <laughs> we'll go through and then if you just indicate the number, I'll make sure you're in. Okay. Mr. Miller? Yes, abstaining from 24 and 25, please. Reverend Walker? Yes. Alexander. Yes, abstaining for item number 20. Mr. Bravo, 22. This is Baylor. Oh, I'm sorry. Did you have another, oh. did you have any abstentions too? She's number 21. Yeah. Thank you, Tim. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> we do believe there's not a need to do that, which we are researching, so oh. we don't have to worry about that anymore. It's um, kind of ridiculous. But, um, Okay. Sorry. All right. Next, Mr. President, I have before me for your consideration one motion and seven resolutions on the consent agenda. However, I am pulling item number four for a future board meeting. These recommendations are in proper form, and I move their approval. So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second on the consent agenda. Any questions or discussion for the consent agenda? Hearing none, roll call please. Mr. Bravo? Yes. Mrs. Lasher? Yes. Mrs. Mansfield? Yes. Mr. Miller? Yes. Reverend Walker? Yes. Mr. Alexander? Yes. Mrs. Baylor? Yeah. And finally, Mr. President, I have before me for your consideration 17 business affairs recommendations. These recommendations are in proper form and I move their approval. So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second on the business affairs recommendations. Any questions, comments, or discussion? I will say I did ask earlier where just where we were for a quick update on the Wonder World initiative and uh, we are doing three through five right now um, and over the summer the teachers will get the uh, technology for K through two and then they'll be implementing that in the fall and then we should be fully implemented at that point so that's really exciting to hear also mine was less uh, technical, but I did check with Ms. Polk about the use of uh, a pagers within the district and got an explanation as to why that's still important um, in a post cellular world. So mm -hmm. she, she straightened that out for me. So. Did you tell everybody why? Would you like to share why? I don't the current pages are used by our maintenance facility team field members and our ESL um, in, mm -hmm. interpreters in our North Hill. Yeah. And believe it or not, tech doesn't always work the same in the pagers work in parts of the building that the cell phones do not. So those are the most important people to get a hold of sometimes, and the pagers are very cost effective and very useful. Are they allowed to get them in like flashy colors? No, they don't. <laughs> <laughs> it's not the 90s. 
the 90s called them my <laughs> We have a motion and a second on business affairs. Any other questions, comments, discussion? Hearing none, roll call, please. This is Lasher. Yes. This is Mansfield. Yes. Mr. Miller. Yes. Reverend Walker. Yes. Mr. Alexander. <coughs> yes. Mrs. Baylor. Yes. Mr. Bravo. Yes. Sure. Superintendent. Um, Mr. President, just wanted to inform you and the board members that um, about a month ago I was contacted by the Ohio Department of Education and asked to participate on their strategic planning process over the next 18 months. So I'll uh, be with their team uh, tomorrow through Friday um, out of state on that. And we're, all, we're working in a cohort with uh, the state of Wisconsin and Nevada, um, mm -hmm. I believe, and this uh, same uh, process where they're going through their strategic plan process. There are some community meetings that are going to be held around the state uh, during the month of March on their uh, strategies as they seek public input similar to what they did with uh, graduation requirements. So I will provide a report. Uh, when I return on the progress. Uh, because we've gone long, uh, I'm, uh, no president's report tonight. Treasurer's report? No report. Committee reports, legal contracts, and board policies? Uh, yes. Uh, presented for the second of three readings prior to approval, we have revised bylaw <laughs> section 0130 functions, revised bylaw section 0140 membership. Revised bylaw section 0150 organization. Revised bylaw section 0160 meetings. And revised policy 2260 non discrimination and access to equal educational opportunity. And the, you guys are going to do the third reading in committee and then bring it back here? I don't know. I, I mentioned something in that committee. It would be nice to have two readings here, so we always had an opportunity to talk about it. So I'm not, I wish you come back here for the third reading, I believe. Yeah. Because um, I, I may have a question, too. I have three written down, but I was going to see if, uh, if you were going to discuss them again at the next. Okay. We will bring them back here for a third reading. Okay. Third and final reading. This is a very novice question, but is there an easy way to tell what the updates are, or should we just compare them to the... The, the version that's in there is a track changes version. Oh, okay. It's not always super clear, but you can tell it's yeah. struck and underlined, and yeah. Okay. It's Thank a PDF you. of the track changes. Version. Okay. Good question. Um, okay. Finance and Capital Management. The Finance Committee uh, met on February 22nd, and the following members were present. Uh, Mr. Miller, myself, Mr. James, Ms. Nooser, uh, and Mr. Pingleton. Information was in review. The highlights are as follows. One, we talked about the con consolidation of administration and op buildings, and the Finance Committee will review an RFP information for 10 North, North Main Street and then the second was the Paladina, which was very good news. Paladina held an open house for the Akron Public Schools February 6th and the 13th. Enrollment is up to about 1,200 employees. Um, Paladina is working on hiring another uh, doctor dedicated to APS staff because of that uh, increase. Uh, we encourage all of those persons who have enrolled to take advantage the way this works is you have to go in and uh, participate in the services that the physician uh, will provide. So that means you've got to go in, uh, do whatever, the exams, etc., and that helps that process, if my understanding is correct. So we've got to actively, not just simply enroll, have your name on the list, like having your name, well, in the church world, you've got to actually participate <laughs> in, uh, in, in, uh, in that activity. Also, uh, Paladina is working, as I said, to hire another physician. The district has received a total of $30,331,557.52 uh, in local, state, and federal grants 
for this fiscal year, including a generous donation from Goodyear to support the STEM schools and STEM hub. The Finance Department is actively working with the Business Affairs on the consolidation of the administration and our buildings, including coordinating tours for the staff of the new facilities. And uh, we'll be coming back later on with some more information as to timetables and when we hope to have all that done. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But this might be a uh, crazy question, but does the Paladina doctors report back to the person who's being seen, their primary care doctor, of what has gone on with them? So they know if we have a persistent uh, record as to what is what they've seen in the box, so the primary care doctor will have that information in their file. It is not automatic. Mm -hmm. It's only if uh, the primary care doctor requests that information or if there's a reason to request that. So, so if I wanted my, if I say for example, if I went and I wanted my doctor to have that in my record, so he knows that I've been there treated, do I have to ask him to send it, or do my, does my doctor have to request it? Um, I'm sure there's an information sharing agreement between the mm -hmm. two, but I believe your primary care doctor would initiate that. Okay. Well, I actually thought Paladina were trying to get the Paladina doctors to be primary yeah, care for. Yeah, for we don't. We, we want this yeah. to be an and, yeah. not an or. Um, okay. But you know that's a, definitely a possibility where uh, you're not leaning on your primary care doctor as much. Okay. Good question. Anything else for finance and capital management? Can I just, just say one thing? We did briefly discuss what you brought up about personnel recommendations and whether or not those should be in personnel recs. And I think the, the thought process, at least some of the things we said out loud uh, talking amongst ourselves was, you know, there are some people that may want to see that in there and maybe not. I think it's sort of bothersome myself that maybe other people at this table want those to remain and the personnel recommendations, so something to think about in the context. I think you could discussion. probably leave them in. I just don't think we need to abstain, abstain. from them. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's not. We've had that argument a couple times since someone yeah. whether yeah. we need to abstain. I really don't think we do. There, when I read through the policy, though, it does say that we can't vote on something that benefits us, right? So mm -hmm. this in, we're paying, essentially, you're paying yourself if you don't abstain. It's a board wants to have it, uh, we talked about it being in the sunshine as it relates to sunshine laws, but if the board would like, we can issue an addendum to the board agenda and not vote on it. Your board policy authorizes the treasurer to make those reimbursements. They're a de minimis value, they're very small value. So if we want to produce a report for the media or any public entity that requests them, we can just have it uh, as an attachment. And then we we don't have to have that one. But do they even necessarily have to be in the personnel racks? They do not. Yeah. Which yeah. I think, again, if they if we want to leave them in there for sunshine purposes, I'm all for it. I just think it's silly to have to mm -hmm. abstain from them when we don't really need to. There's but no having them in as an agenda, they're still part of sunshine. So. Yeah. Yeah. So I think what do they just go under consent? Because yeah. then when one of us forgets or something, yeah. 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 We'll work on a couple. Yeah. Okay. All right. Here comes hey. the committee that's working really hard right now. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of stuff going on in our place. Uh, instructional policy and student achievement. Okay, our instructional policy committee met last Friday and would like to just bring some updates. As you know, last board meeting, we distributed the recommended names of our college and career academies across our high schools. As a reminder, this board previously approved all of our college and career pathways. Our academy teams in each high school then took the approved pathways and combined three to five together to make small learning communities based on career pathways that make sense together. <clears throat> After the academy teams uh, determined which pathways would be combined, they recommended a name for the academy. Did anyone have any questions or suggestions for these? Okay, hearing none, no. <laughs> if no, <laughs> we'll go ahead and move forward and start using them. 
Lisa. Um, the next item is the named partner um, integration with our college and her academy. So as we talked about earlier and just voted on, we, um, we were out at Kent State University this past week. And we also have our partnership with uh, Akron Children's Hospital. And so at last board meeting, we distributed the proposed template that would be used to outline the responsibilities of both partners to our district um, to use as a basis for the future named partner integration agreements. We hadn't heard any questions or suggestions. Did anybody have any that they brought with them? So we can answer those now. Um, you'll start to see these components in future agreements that'll come before the board. Um, again, these were just two of the ones that we've had a few sneak previews and you're gonna be very mm -hmm. excited about the yeah. ones that are coming up. So we anticipate a lot of announcements over the next six months, so stay tuned. That's called a tease in the news business. <laughs> um, and so also you'll see you've got two updates and handouts that you were given. One is for college and career academies, and the other is for the I Promise School. So lots of exciting things going on. So please take a look at those um, in the interest of time. We won't go over, over a lot of that say last year we had so much excitement just in launching the college and career academies but i think the real excitement is this year okay. when you look at the kent state cooperative agreement that we're doing or that we did tonight i mean that's almost a million dollars of in-kind you know mm -hmm. commitments from the kent state university uh, for the work that they'll be doing with our kids so and that's pretty phenomenal mm -hmm. uh, all right any unfinished business yeah Sorry. Okay, I was just going to bring up, you know, in the context of the ad hoc committee that you're having me chair, uh, the student behavior and discipline, and talking about the safety as well. Uh, we, we did have a committee meeting this week, and uh, we are moving forward. We're asking certain community members to step up. We, we have a definite... Uh, we have one of our co-chairs committed to helping with us, and that is Mr. Jeremy Lyle from Heart to Heart Communications. Uh, he tells me his wife, Christy, comes with a package, so she's going to be working with us as well. Uh, I guess we're playing phone tag with somebody else we have in mind. We hope to announce that person very soon. Once we have our co-chairs, then we will be getting together with them to sit down, discuss who we're going to have move forward, uh, something you said at the table this evening, you know, uh, as far as community buy-in, I think it's very important that this committee be led by community members, not necessarily somebody who sits here or sits, you know, in administration or a teacher for that matter. It's going to be community-led. Uh, I'm going to be co-chair in the standpoint from sort of being the traffic cop to make sure we stay on task and on time on this. And once once we have our two co-chairs then we're going to sit down and discuss who we want to bring to that discussion uh, I've asked our superintendent and assi assistant superintendent to put together a list of our uh, partners who deal with behavior and safety and discipline uh, outside of the Akron Public Schools walls because it's important for them to be at the table with us uh, just so we can maybe attempt to if there's a lack of coordination or a lack of communication, get those partners all on the same, uh, you know, same playing field with us and all communicating together. I sort of use an analogy to how Arts Now has brought the uh, community of uh, art together where they were disjointed before. I'm not saying that our partners are disjointed, but we want to make sure that they are not, uh, and they're working together for the benefit of our uh, every all the stakeholders. So that is moving forward. Uh, I think uh, initially it was reported, I did say to a reporter, I'm looking to have it going by April 1. Uh, I'd like to be a little more aggressive than that if I can and get it going faster than that, but uh, I guess time will tell. Uh, now this committee is going to be more of a long-term committee. We're not necessarily going to look at uh, the task at hand with safety, the, the, the discussion that came out of February 14th in Florida. Uh, that's certainly a worthy discussion and a very important discussion to have. Uh, and there will be some building safety talk there as well, but I think that's going to be on a long-term basis. Uh, there's a more short-term discussion we have to have about what happened last week. So. And we did say that 
to some degree, the, the committee may have some things that it looks at kind of as a spin-off, and whether that's physical building security or whether that's, you know, looking at, uh, but um, to Tim's point, I think, and for the benefit of the community, I mean, it really was envisioned that, you know, I asked Tim to chair this, as he said, as the traffic up to keep it going, uh, but in the initial discussions, really wanted, again, yes, to be led by community and to be really interdisciplinary, um, sort of bringing us in at the beginning as to how we got where we are and where are we, and what questions do we need to answer, what issues do we need to address, and then set up the meetings uh, going forward to talk about that. Um, but I do want to emphasize, too, that this did come sort of on the heels of the discussion over um, student discipline and and the, the safe schools rally and, and sort of the things that were around that. But this is separate and apart from the grievances, right? I mean, we have to address that and those by themselves and work with, you know, our union, our union uh, president, AEA president is here, Pat Scheib, um, and we have to work with them on that, but that is separate and apart. This is about, once we handle this, how do we move forward proactively? What kind of questions and issues, how are we addressing uh, school climate, student safety, and discipline as a whole? Are our policies and procedures are effective? Is what we're doing work? What is restorative justice? Maybe that's part of it. And do we have the tools necessary to do that effectively? And are we doing it effectively? So two separate things. I just want to emphasize that again, so that when we're working together, uh, people understand that we're working together here and here. We're working together to address those issues that were brought um, to our attention uh, separately from the work that the committee is doing. So, and and I will say, you know, to to as far as offshoots, I think that's very possible. You know, Ellen was discussing, but you know, when we did the the. Uh, steering committees for college and career academies. There were focus teams. Uh, I was even asked in the meeting what was my vision of how these are going to look. In my mind, now once again, we have community leaders may have a different idea, but I think it could look very much like the steering committees did for college and career academies. And they had focus groups, uh, and and you know, and they came came back and reported out to the committee as a whole. David was talking about you know in the in the context of college and career academies what the whole student looks like, and the social emotional piece is part of that. So this could just be a natural extension of the steering committees we had with college and career academies. Uh, that all being said, uh, I do want to make sure that we do employ actions when we are done talking about this. I don't know that we'll ever be done talking about it, but as far as this committee goes, I want to make sure that we uh, are actionable on you know, what we find, discover, and agree upon needs to be done. One question. Are we going to have any principals, teachers, or parents on that Certainly. committee? Yeah. Okay, great, great. Yeah. General yeah. justice. Uh, okay. yeah. And we're looking at, you know, community people, people right. that uh, various areas of the of the right. city. And uh, as uh, Brother Miller mentioned, the superintendent has been asked, mm -hmm. we'll ask the two persons that are leading mm -hmm. to suggest people in the community. Mm -hmm. uh, there have been, I suggested, uh, a young lady out of Kenmore who works with the pastoral sort of care has been working with a lot of our students mm -hmm. even today, if she would mind working on that once we get things moving along, uh, to get th all those people involved and as the same pattern that we use with college and career, which involved every segment of the community. We had our youth in there, we had a youth engagement, we had parents, we had teachers, we had community people, uh, pa our partners, all of those were part of... Uh, what we did with college and career. So that's sort of how we envision that. And it just so happened we both won college and career as well. So we <laughs> envision that as how we want to move in that direction. Because it's important, I think, that the community knows that we are very sensitive, mm -hmm. that there is a concern, right. there is a problem. We want to address it. We want to address it in a very fair, very open open way mm -hmm. so that everybody understands we're trying to make sure we bring again the word wholeness to to what we're doing 
so we want to have all the segments involved as much as possible. Uh, and again, the piece that we're doing something. We're not just sitting here and seeing everything going on around us and people are hurting and calling and concerned. Yes, we want to do something. But again, we, we have to set things up so that in the end, there are things that we're going to be answering to and we want to say, this is how we can solve those. Maybe the reason I just asked that, because I, for lack of a better term, is a lay person, not just community leaders, but a lay person or people are at times the parents and others, so sure. to have them as a voice because they know uh, a lot. And you, you mentioned mental health, which is big. I'm glad to hear that. Very glad to hear that. Uh, there'll be, you know, teachers, Mm -hmm. People from the city. Yeah. I mean, once again, we're. I mean, if they're a stakeholder, just, I guess sort of let your imagination run wild. I mean, they all need to be at the table. Mm -hmm. Thank you. With uh, can we uh, maybe we know the other two safety things? Can we talk about the uh, uh, resolutions putting safety and reducing violence? Oh, just got one more yeah. item. We have one more item of unfinished business there. So, in connection with the Finance and Capital Management Committee, um, I would like to get approval of a resolution uh, to engage a uh, wealthy building company as the construction manager for the project at 10 North Main, which of course is the consolidation of the Sylvester Small Building and Conrad Ott Building. We've looked through some of our um, uh, previous uh, request for proposals for a construction manager and of course most of those companies just deal with schools on the OFCC program and this is a little different because it's office space and um, got a proposal from Welty for pre-construction services and right now those costs are not expected to exceed forty thousand dollars as we engage in uh, negotiations with different contractors at the appropriate time where we'll get similar to the school construction uh, part from contractors where they give us a guaranteed maximum price and then Welty manages that whole process. We're using that same project delivery method at Ellet. We're using that same project uh, delivery method at the new Kimmore Garfield uh, Community Learning Center. And it's been in existence in the private sector for quite some time and so uh, the proposal is to uh, have that uh, contract with Welty to start that process because we have to really have those conversations with our architect and designer for what we're going to do at the building. We had uh, meetings today for, uh, and Ryan was present at those, and so I was huddled up in meetings this morning, but some stakeholder meetings with staff about what they want to see at 10 North Main, and I'll let Ryan take over. So part of the engagement process before bringing back what we're calling the FET plans now to you is to engage as many of the internal stakeholders as possible. So today, I think we have four meetings here at the admin, and there will be another associated focus groups at the OSH building tomorrow. Uh, once we get the feedback uh, to our architects, we put the final I think we're on the fourth or fifth versions of our FIT plans. The reason they're called FIT plans is right now we take the department, we look at the total square footage. Our internal architects have produced that study of the data and then um, our department kind of touches on it. We have follow up building tour with the board and then, um, then put some construction plans together. You guys are on the fourth or fifth version. Or will the board just be seeing the final, or will there be something with the board where there's some board input on the FIT plan? Yeah, so let's just underscore FIT plan right now. So FIT plan is, a little bit more detail about that, is a square footage study produced from the architect's office as if we were going to move into 400 West Market some years ago. So that was resurrected. We looked at the that same FIT plan in terms of square footage per department. So the finance department has 15 people. We need approximately this amount of square foot. 
the next thing that we looked at is um, is what are the top five priorities or so of the building obviously with the focus of the customer floors one and two quickly get focused in on board and staff development as it relates to the OT staff development center and then the boardroom and how we interact with the public on the first floor okay, so who's, who's providing fit fit foot space for the boardroom the board area the board conference room the board a little bit of so you guys there who's so the, that? the board gets final say um, before we move into the construction phase so you've had all of your staff all of your stakeholders all of the employees get a chance to have say into how the work should flow once we're under one roof in terms of that square footage that plan and before we move into construction documents we want the board to go through the building one more time see how that interacts with each department and make the final edits make sense so we'll wrap up staff focus groups tomorrow and then um, within the next two weeks we'll want to schedule that tour with the board what's happening questions so do we have a motion on the resolution to approve contract for wealthy building company so moved second we have a motion and a second. Any questions, comments, discussion on that resolution? Hearing none, roll call, please. Mrs. Baylor? Yes. Mr. Bravo? Yes. Mrs. Lasher? Yes. Mrs. Mansfield? Yes. Mr. Miller? Yes. Robert Walker? Yes. Mr. Alexander? Yes. And new business. We can talk. Uh, we can do the Fifth Amendment to the office space lease first since we're off. Under new business, uh, there's a Fifth Amendment to the office lease. Uh, as you know, we were approached by Sumacare and the delay of the East End project. They'd like to extend the lease. Um, of their stay at, at 10 North Main after working with the architects. Um, we are in agreement to extend up to eight weeks. Uh, it will not impact our timeline in producing construction documents. We have access to the building. The difference is we will own the building as of April 2nd in terms of our timeline. So we will be the landlord. The Fifth Amendment to the office lease amends our original purchase agreement with Signet. And then if you remember in the attachments at the end of the agreement, there was what's called the assumption of leases. So this will be a permanent part of that contract, just like the subway downstairs was an assumption of a lease. So that was the cleanest um, amendment to the contract and least expensive option for us to consider. We'll collect those rents that will help offset the cost as well for we will be the landlord at that point in time, so there will be an existing lease in place that will correct the collect rents. Any questions, comments, discussions on the Fifth Amendment to the office? Do we have a motion? So moved. Okay. We have a motion and a second. Roll call, please. Mr. Miller? Yes. Reverend Walker? Yes. Mr. Alexander? Yes. Mrs. Baylor? Yes. Mr. Bravo? Yes. Mrs. Slasher? Yes. Mrs. Mansfield? Yes. All right. Before we get into the big discussion over student demonstrations, um, OSBA ha and the superintendent pulled this for us. OSBA has a resolution supporting school safety and reducing violence in schools. Um, and I'd like to read it and then offer it to the board for consideration. Uh, today. Can I just go into, I was at the meeting on Saturday. Um, the OSBA trustee. Um, yes, yeah, so um, there was a lot of discussion. Just No, that's okay. Before you read it, um, it, it, it is as, it is an endorsement of safety, but it is also taking into consideration the vast and 
diverse population of the state of Ohio. How is that for as politically correct as I can put it? Um, so it is, in my mind, it is a resolution that encourages safety and it encourages um, safe use of firearms. It may not be as far as as perhaps this board or folks in you know our position might want to go but they're encouraging us as a board to adopt it as written to make a strong statement to the legislature if that makes sense so it's very benign as far as i'm concerned it's, it doesn't have if you had a chance to read it it's not it, we're not going to set the world on fire with this but it is showing a strong force of school boards across the state to stand together for the students of Ohio. I even suggest in the resolution that it, you know, like the one that you're talking about too, the one clause talks about just striking the balance between the two competing. In order to, so. we all agree we want our schools to be safe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right now, we can't agree as a country or as a state as to what gun control looks like. So basically, they're trying to, they tried to come up with as well as, as, well as they could, come up with a resolution that, um, that strikes a balance emphasizing school safety. So why don't we read it and then you can, in case you haven't had a chance to. Whereas school violence has become an epidemic in the United States of America, and whereas the children and school employees of our nation deserve to attend school without fear of death or injury, and their families deserve to send them to school without the same fear, and whereas there is a mutual responsibility of all citizens to address this problem and the responsibility for preventing violent incidents cannot be relegated to school districts alone, and whereas multiple studies have shown that the majority of Americans support action to eliminate violence in our schools, and whereas school board members, administrators, employees, and community members should work together with lawmakers, legal counsel, law enforcement, and security experts to determine to determine how best to ensure student safety in their district. Now therefore be it resolved. Section one, that the Akron Board of Education implores the President of the United States, the Governor of the State of Ohio, the United States Congress, and the Ohio General Assembly to prioritize the protection of students and school employees by enacting legislation with funding for the following. Number one, enhanced mental health services and substance abuse treatments so that all individuals, including children, have sufficient access to these services. Number two, increased access to school safety measures, including but not limited to, limited to school resource officers, school safety infrastructure, and other security measures designed to protect students and staff from an active shooter on school grounds. It is before you for consideration. Would anyone like to make a motion? I'll make a motion. Sure. We have a motion and a second on a resolution supporting school safety and reducing violence in schools. Roll call, please. Mr. Bravo? Yes. Mrs. Lasher? Yes. Mrs. Mansfield? Yes. Mr. Miller? Yes. Reverend Walker? Yes. Mr. Alexander? Yes. Mrs. Baylor? Yes. And continuing our discussion on uh, school safety, uh, as a result of Parkland, the shooting in Parkland, Florida, out of that grew the Never Again movement, which of course is student-led initiative to uh, bring awareness and, and some, maybe some legislative changes to, um, to school safety, to issues surrounding school safety. How's that for politically correct? Um, on, on March 14th, there is scheduled a 17-minute nationwide student walkout as part of uh, the Never Again movement. And so we want to put this before the board for discussion uh, to determine what role, if any, we should have in supporting our students and having a voice uh, in this issue. Uh, because if, if it affects anybody, it affects them. And, uh, and I think we want to recognize that, but I think we also want to recognize um, the need to be safe and proactive and uh, ensure that our students can do that in a way that is uh, not disruptive and is safe to them and safe to the people around them and it also doesn't put them in harm's way um, at all. So I'd like to open that up. We've had multiple discussions with the school district and I also want to throw out and, and may get your thoughts on this path. Um, 
you know, the AEA has reached out as well and is interested in being a part of this conversation and supporting uh, whatever we can do to make sure the students have an opportunity to be heard if they'd like to be heard in this district. So with that, I will open it up to... Did you want her to you want to have any comments first? And then we can... okay. I'm happy to. I mean, I, I just want to mirror what President Bronco said earlier in the meeting about the incredible tragedies we're seeing, um, not only recently, but in the recent past. Mm -hmm. This is, seems to be becoming an epidemic, and it's, it's such a tragedy. And, and acknowledging that, I also want to acknowledge that, you know, since Parkland, um, there's been a groundswell of student and young voices across the country in this area. Um, really coming with purposeful and and very authentic voices in, in how it impacts our students and our staffs and our buildings. Um, I I reached out to the board um, just as, as recently and just as early as this morning um, when we woke up to news of yet another tragedy with two students in Northwest schools. Um, doesn't necessarily have to happen in our buildings. It can happen with our students and our families outside of our buildings, too. Um, I, I think that we have responsibility to recognize and acknowledge those students' voices and in a very meaningful way. Um, and I would certainly like to, I know AEA and our members have been impacted by this. Um, and there but for the grace of God. You know, we've had, had issues in our buildings, but um, I think moving forward, we really have to open that communication with our students and allow them, um, you know, in, in these tragedies, you hear from people, and there's always rhetoric flying on both sides. And I've heard some, some statements made that, oh, they're just young kids, and they're you know, idealists and they can't really affect any change and, and I would take a, a real issue with that. I think that our students, particularly if we're talking about Africa public school students, need to be acknowledged and, and need to have a safe platform, uh, particularly on the 14th, to in some way um, have their voices heard and, and, and allow them to lead that that movement, and we do want to do it in a safe manner, um, however that comes together, um, not being necessarily board or teacher or administratively led, but really allow those students, and I know that's going to look different in our elementary buildings and in our secondary buildings, but I do believe even in the elementary buildings we can have conversations around kindness and, and bullying and and, and how they're feeling, because I think we have some students that have been really affected by this. So AEA is happy and, and willing and, and, um, and wanting to work with the board to really maybe put something together in the very short next few weeks so that our, our students can be heard on the 14th in a safe way. So thank you. Thank you. I think we discussed earlier in the, uh, our scrimmage ways that we might be able to uh, make sure that students have a voice, have a very safe uh, situation where children can, uh, on the 14th, express their concerns. I know the superintendent has mentioned some things, and maybe we want, might want to Mr. President hear from him after our discussion that we had today and see what we can come up with as possible solutions uh, to have a safe response uh, to the Mr. President, I know Dr. McWilliams Woods had a meeting with the um, current directors and I think they have some ideas. Yeah, we we discussed this afternoon uh, similar to, to what uh, Mr. Scheip is saying that it can look different between elementary, middle, and high school, but I think we'd like to find the important term here is a safe manner to focus primarily on this, the lost lives of the 17 students and safety <coughs> moving forward. 
Um, and I think we can work with our principals and uh, Mrs. Scheidt with some teacher representatives to look at what those options could be that we could then um, work within our each of our schools. Well, do we know, and I, I don't want to work the board, but just something to consider, do we know if any of our schools already have something planned and are we going to be able to move quickly enough to do something since this is really only about two and a half weeks away? Yeah, there's been interest uh, in some of our schools. We've heard from a few buildings saying that some of the students are interested. I don't know of any specific plans yet on what that would look like. But we can move quickly to, to identify options. So did you guys come up with anything in your brainstorming? Um, it, we primarily would prefer the students stay inside for things just because of the safety issue, of, especially for a very national event like this, to have hundreds and hundreds of, potentially of students going outside does not feel comfortable for us because of the public nature of this. Um, but I think that's where we can look at uh, events that can happen inside. I guess my only concern would be if we take too much away from them, then it's not student-led. Mm -hmm. And on the other hand, if we plan a bunch of things inside and they all decide to walk out anyway, then it's going to be a bunch of the adults who have to follow them. Um, so there might have, just a thought, there might have to be some, some balance there. No, I'm just thinking, and, and I agree with what you're saying, having them inside, kind of the gymnasium or auditorium or somewhere. But if they actually want to go outside, especially in the high school, we have football fields in big areas, maybe they can just go and be in those areas. Mm -hmm. Because I I, I, I I, want to make sure they're safe too, that's the only thing that's... Right. It, it, I would really like our teachers and principals to sit down and talk about this, because they're going to be the ones managing right. Right. this. So I want to make sure that they can weigh in on what they feel comfortable with. And again, it's very different elementary, mm -hmm. middle school, and high school. And if I could just interject here, um, I think that, I, and I know it's a short timeline and that we really would have to uh, do something very quickly here, but I think that our teachers and our, our principals, and particularly in our secondary buildings, probably have a better gauge temperature-wise on the student leaders that might be the ones that are offshoots and say, well, we're going to walk out anyway. And if we can get a handle on that, if there are buildings that can identify those students and maybe even have those students involved in um, from the beginning um, in, in um, modeling something or forming something together, that that, that might help with those um, random students that are that want to put on their own. own if we do, maybe we just give them the space and then let them do what they you know. You have a right. seventeen minute walkout. And we're going to support you. Here's the space. Do what you want with it. Use it as an open mic. Use it as a uh, we all a sit in. Use it as a whatever you want to do. I think we should honor what uh, Dr. McGriggins was said and let them kind of put it together and then present it to us and then you know kind of do our input at that time. But let her staff you know put it together because like she said they have a pulse on you know the, the principals and the teachers they have a pulse on the students and what they're like and things like that so they can definitely provide the, the input that, that we need so but at the same time acknowledging that we don't want to water down that that student voice absolutely. That, in planning, absolutely. That, that it really has to come from them Mm -hmm. Well, we know that if you take ownership or you, you're involved in the process, you take more ownership for what's going on. So for them to be involved, I think, is very important. But just how you're going to do that is what you got to work together. And, and I guess the assumption is, is there a desire on the part of our students? We've heard outside of the areas that they want to do is your desire for our students that this is something that they want to do not like well, we're pushing a piece, them there's a video post right. that I've been tagged is something I've tagged and then Mr. we find Bowen. out who those <laughs> particular persons are and gather their voices these are things that we can do 
you know, we've shared some options, you've met with them. These are some things that we can do that provide safety, provide an avenue for boys. If it's up to go out, we talk about students are outside when we have fire drills. Is there something that we can do in that manner that's safe? It's some other kind of things. As you said, we talked about even the stadiums or something that are in our schools where students might be able to assemble. So, but give them an opportunity now. These are options, these are safe things, because we, we're going to have to provide, you know, safety. And then we don't want to have an opportunity to provide persons who have negative things to come in and make something that's supposed to be positive end up being something that's very negative and dangerous for our students as well. So we got to look at both sides. Yeah, safety has to be discussed as normal right. for the students to let them know. Right. They, they, they organize it, but you think of safety first. Right. Two quick thoughts. I, I think there's some misinformation on social media right now where it's like, well, you get suspended if you walk out, people are sharing that kind of stuff. So I think as soon as possible, if we can figure out how to message something to the broader community that this is the plan, that's going to be critical. And I, I just think it's a brilliant point to be sure that it is really student-led. So if it's something like your student leadership can meet with the school staff leadership to come up with something together. Because maybe a football field at one school would work, but at another school, there's no way that would work. So that do it custom based on what the students at that school want or don't want. There's not any kind of student leadership wanting to do that. That's putting it back on the principals and teachers because they know they're students. So I think we start there and then go from there, but do it in an expeditious manner, you know, in light of the time that we from have. From a policy perspective, we'll have to talk about the discipline issue because there, it is going to come up. Some, someone's going to take it too far or not, not want to do something, so there's going to have to be alternatives and... You know, and the stuff that Mr. James provided us as far as how the policies go, I mean, we're going to have to talk about that student that stays for 37 minutes instead of 17 minutes. Or, I mean, so I think providing them with, like, this runway and this space and, a, like, a safe space and then letting them figure out what they want to do is probably the best thing. But from a policy perspective, we're going to have to consider, you know, making sure that it's safe, but it's, you know still controlled, and what happens for the ones where it's maybe a little out of control or a little beyond the road. When you say we, how, how do you mean that? Because our next board Me meeting... you. <laughs> our next board meeting is March 12th. Yeah, two days before. So we are not going to, we as a board are not going to be able to have to, we're going to have to give the administrations in the school the leverage to be able to enforce yes. Yes. what policies exist. and. We also have to consider students that may not want to, or parents who may not want their children to. I want to make sure that, again, I heard a lot of the same things that Ms. Lasher has heard, that there's been some talk out there that, well, this, any staff that, that's involved in anything like this is going to be reprimanded, any students are going to be suspended. So we want to make sure that we're getting the right information out there, that those things aren't true. because. I know that the day that I heard about it, I reached out to the superintendent who had already been reaching out to AEA and, and working to, to make that happen. We don't want to squash student or staff. This is their work environment. This is their, this is where they go every day. So we want to make sure we um, encourage that. I know the city has offered to help. That was reinforced to me today. If we want to do something that is outside, that they are willing to help in any way that they can. Um, I know, I, I think I believe it was for the Tamir Rice incident, we had a some kind of march or something mm -hmm. that we did at Firestone. Was that what that one was for? That was a little different. Okay. There that were, was after school. There and that were was... some students who had posters, and those posters were taken away. And, okay. you know, the board already has policies right. that covers mm -hmm. it. So um, any student, even for this type of demonstration, if it gets out of line, still falls under our code of student conduct, whether they're on the campus or off the campus right. during the school day. I think, you know, just from what I heard earlier with directors, it is respecting, you know, student voice, but at the same time, it's also ensuring that they're safe, whether they're on our campus or off. And I think 
having that done at the grassroots level at the school where our teachers and the staff and the students are on the same page is the best thing that we can have because there are opportunities or there are times during the school year. I mean, think about in the fall, some, you know, when we're at pep rally, sometimes they involve things going up. You know, think about Harvest Day when kids are walking around the bit in the neighborhood. So we do have models where those things have happened, you know, without, uh, you know, any uh, negative, you know, events. So I, I just trust that the buildings can, you know, pull that off with some guidance, you know, from uh, Central Oak. <laughs> Do you think that many community members would also like to be involved in these kinds of things? And is that something to consider? Or even at grassroots level, just be sure that that is part of the conversation at each individual facility? I'd be good to let some of our local leaders know if there are things that, plan, that are planned at some of the buildings to let, say, the council folks know. I mean, you know, the students that you've seen as part of the Never Again moment are engaging with their community leaders, they're engaging with elected officials. It might be good to let our local elected officials and leaders know you know, if you're in that area, hey, Ken Moore Garfield is doing this, we think, if we know what they're doing, or Book Duel is doing this. I mean, we kind of know nationwide what the parameters are, and maybe those folks can be engaged that way, too, and get the word out to their, you know, their constituents or their people. It might be the fastest way to get some of it out. And I, I, I agree with that. We have, we have an iconic... mm -hmm. I guess we're almost kind of saying two different things where it's kid oriented, but we're saying adults and so forth. So we're kind of going to have, if it's going to be kid oriented, then we need to make sure it's kid oriented. And because and, and, I'm scared yeah. some of the parents come, they're going to come and scrutinize more people, more crowd control. And so and if it's going to be student regulated, I think. And I agree with Superintendent James and Stan and Dr. Green, which is kind of letting them do what I feel more comfortable with. Well, I think isn't there for the community's benefit? Isn't there Saturday before the May primaries set up yeah. this whole thing as well? Because I sort of had Bruce concern. Okay, we're invited. If we invite the community in our building, they have to get buzzed in. They have to, you know, go through security, make sure our students and staff are safe. And if all of our students are outside, and we're, I don't know, bringing a bunch of people right. in that we're not buzzing in and going through security, I don't know. I guess I sort of have a problem with that. Even outside is. You're talking about people can be walking down the street and come to participate. So, I mean, I, I, and I don't know if that movement, that we think, I thought the movement was student centric and not necessarily community centric. I don't know, I'd have to, I, you know, I didn't even know what the hashtag was until you told me that last week. So, so I don't know. Well, I guess from a like policy out, perspective, but. then, are we saying to, uh, we want to be as flexible as possible with our policies? to ensure that our students can express themselves and have a voice uh, in the safest manner possible. And we're going to leave that up to staff and the buildings to figure out, but be intentional, too, about including um, AEA and our teachers so that they can support our students as well. Is that kind of what we're saying? I and mean, there's nothing really to vote on. But I think we need to have a consensus that we do want to provide some flexibility to Lisa's point. Our next meeting is two days before. So obviously we'll be checking in both individually and I'll keep checking in. I'm sure Reverend will keep checking in. But um I think we all will check in. Is that on this one? Yeah. Is that the consensus though as far as what we'd like to see them do? Yeah. Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Procedurally, will we have to suspend our bylaws regarding? Yeah, that's a good idea. No, because no. it's school sanctioned. Okay, uh, I don't know. The policies and guidelines, I think, are written so they can. If it's, you know, the issue is yes, student voice. But it, if you're going to have students released, you know, from their school day, you know, where we take attendance period by period at the high schools. As long as it's a school sanctioned event, and then that's not considered a demonstration that, that as long as the policy is good. Okay, it's it's not, and therefore not disruptive. Right, right. right. That's why I was saying because we they're still in school. Yeah, this is a school day for them. Right. So right. still right. that time period of being in school. They're still acting public school students. No, it's going to be certainly be a teaching moment. Certainly. Right, right. And, and right. there's 
again, as I mentioned, a scrimmage, and and uh, Mrs. Porter did the uh, presentation at OSBA. There's legal precedence for students having the right to do such things, as long as it's not disruptive uh, for the building. So, to have some sort of demonstration is not not new. We've done things before. It's just how we do it. And I think we, the president summarized things in a very nice fashion. And, and now it's up to you know the, the the staff and the superintendent to bring some things. We communicate all the time as a board. You know, we get information and the president will keep us up to date, the superintendent. So we'll be communicating between now and then to make sure that everything goes to as much as we can control and uncontrol certain things that give them, just as you said, flexibility because yeah, they want, you know, that voice to do what they, you know, to express themselves in a very, you know, this is the part of the healing process uh, that, that we want them to have. Do you think it would be possible to write like a short statement that then we could put on our social media or something that it says what you say and in a way that is shareable that's like a, hey, this is the message. This is the plan. Not right now. Yeah, maybe not. To, well, as soon as possible. We need it like... Yeah, but not, 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 not the poor exactly. shape. Yeah, not the plan necessarily, but just that, yeah. that we want that we're going to be flexible. Exactly. Yeah, that same thing that you just yeah. said, right. I think yeah. that would be fine. I think that would be clear. Because then, yeah, be so for the eventually. post that Lisa's tagging me in, thank you. <laughs> um, we, everyone can at least copy and paste that statement if they need right. to. If right. you start seeing on social media, Ginger's on social media, and sees that says, oh my, my kid's not getting suspended over this, and they better not. Wait, she could we? copy and paste that, and they would say, no, don't worry, no. we're going to well, provide what they have. After it comes, yeah. I mean, right. after it's formed and shaped, the statement. I'm saying not they right, want right now. They that they can them. use right now to quell the problem. I think if I, I would really prefer to kind of uh, Ms. Baylor's point, if, if we can just have one message go out, because one person's interpretation of the word flexible is going to be very different than the next person, than what our flexible term might be. So, so I'd really... You give us that statement? <laughs> I'd prefer that if you just give us a couple days to mm -hmm. try to figure out, so we just have one statement going out saying, here's how we're handling it. And then it goes out there. So just give us a couple days. We just say, we will support it. Stay tuned. <laughs> Something. Yeah, even the word support okay. can okay. mean a whole lot. Okay. Uh, you know, so okay. we can just Stay tuned. Am I going to get in trouble with that one? Stay tuned. Right. 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 Let's not right. kill it by committee, though, because yeah. while we're busy doing that for days, social media is already right. blowing up. It has been going so. off since Friday yeah. on us. Why are we supporting yeah. it? Why are we going to be spending correct. their kids? You know, and that's been going on since Friday. Well, maybe the superintendent and I can talk with Mark Williamson and come up with a statement now. Well, we don't I'm want anything to come back to bite us. We don't want to be premature in anything. We ha we have to be politically correct, or else it's going to come back on us. I mean, we need to yeah. do this right. And if I could, I'm also always concerned because our our teachers and staff always get mixed messages too. So sure. I agree with Dr. McLean Woods that everybody needs to be on the same page and interpret it in the same way if possible because. Um, we need to have, those are the people that are going to be hands on keeping those kids safe and they need to understand what their role is or is not and how to react to that thing. Mm -hmm. um, I have some language from AASA about, because this is nothing new, it's going on for years, so I'll pass that along and then you can modify it. But it um, I know in Los Angeles, years ago, they had something similar and had a U.S. Department of Education and put together a guidance document for that, so I'll pass that. And I think the suspension issue came from actually school districts in Wisconsin, because that was a trending thing that the superintendent said, any kid who walks out is going to get suspended for three days, and, mm -hmm. you know, but that's their board and their district, and I know we're a little different. I'm glad. We are active. All right. Great discussion. I enjoy that. Um, 
Anything else before we would entertain a motion in the executive session? Anything for the good of the Hearing none, then pursuant to Ohio Revised Code Section 121.22G1 to discuss the dismissal of a public employer official of the school district and Revised Code Section 121.22G2 to consider the purchase or sale of property. I'm asking for a motion to recess into executive session. So moved. We have a motion and a second. Any questions or discussion before we go? Hearing none, roll call please. Gregory Walker? Yes. Mr. Alexander? <laughs> yes. Mrs. Baylor? Yes. Mr. Bravo? Yes. Mrs. Lasher? Yes. Mrs. Batesfield? Yes. Mr. Miller? Yes. I'm getting better. <laughs>